Welcome to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, your guide to future tech trends and innovation in a language you understand. Now, over to your host, Neil Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast, where we're racing to 1,000 podcast episodes and interviews. How crazy is that? But I am still thinking of shaking things up and maybe having a giveaway or something that I can give back to you loyal listeners for listening to me for over four years and a thousand episodes. My current tech calculation suggests that we will hit 1000 episodes in around about October. So we do have a little time, but my question to you all is what free swag would interest you? And also, what would you like to see more of or less of on the show? And remember, you can email me anytime, techblogwriter at outlook.com. If you go to my website, techblogwriter.co.uk, scroll to the bottom, you'll find links to all the social channels and how you can reach me on there too. If you do connect with me or follow me on any of these, all I ask is just send a little note, personalise the note or say that you're a podcast listener, just so I can separate you as a loyal listener from those spammy I follow back brigade and we all know who they are and I don't want to put you in the same pot as those guys but on with today's podcast and we have Gregory Magarashak from Cubics on the show today and I'm excited to get him on because he's clearly passionate about what he's building here and plus he has an amazing story that has involved 7 million app downloads achieving fantastic success but then running into a few problems and hitting the tech headlines for all the wrong reasons too But dealing with both success and failures in tech is exactly what this show is all about. And I hope all these lessons that we talk about today will help other founders on their journey too, and mobile app developers maybe as well. And I also want to find out a lot more about the Cubix platform and how it's actually being used in an app around the presidential candidate Andrew Yang, and how it's also useful for special interest groups, universities and more for people that don't want the risk of centralised platforms selling their data and compromising privacy. So many hot topics in this and so much value. So buckle up and hold on tight so I can beam your ears back to the US so we can speak with Gregory from Cubix because we've got quite a show on our hands today. So a massive warm welcome to the show, Gregory. Can you tell the listeners a little more about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm Greg Magershack, and I have a passion for building software that empowers people and unites communities. I think we need to have more of that. And the kind of software we have today essentially is kind of centralized, and we rent it as opposed to owning it ourselves. Um, So I'd like to see that changed. Absolutely. It's such a great story that you've got there. And looking at your backstory, I quickly learned that you are the creator of Groups and Calendars app on iOS, which picked up an incredible 7 million downloads. So can you tell me a little bit more about that journey and the kind of lessons that you learned along the way? Because I think it's going to be so valuable to other mobile app developers listening and who are going to be hearing about your success today. Yeah, it's, that's actually very exciting. Uh, we started Cubix back in uh, 2011. And uh, you know, with a vision to sort of build the kind of software that lets people connect in the real world, uh, make sense of their address books and calendars, and in general, try to be helpful. So there was a there was a lot of people, obviously, uh, that needed something like this, but we were surprised by just how many just downloaded. We never uh, paid for marketing. I uh, just want to put that out there. Uh, until today, we spent pretty much zero on marketing and PR. Uh, we simply put out apps with the names, groups, and calendar, and then we renamed it to calendars later. Um, I think it's the names uh, that were available in the store that allowed us to do it. And people say there's not good enough names right now, but a couple of years ago, I, I got an app named Teaching in the iOS store. Uh, I want to put out a teaching app for teachers. Uh, I think that was a big part of our success is just naming the apps in such a way that if you're looking for a certain solution and you type in that keyword, uh, you find the app. But of course, just because you're getting people in the door is not enough. You have to actually uh, make sure that you build something they want. And so two other metrics are very important are engagement, user retention, uh, but also virality and making sure that people uh, invite other people. So to be honest, uh, until now, most of the apps were for personal use and not much even virality. So we expect that when we start adding the social features uh, to the apps, 
that we've developed uh, for the Cubix platform. Uh, once we allow community leaders to have these apps and give them to their members to communicate with one another, we're probably going to get about 50x uh, or 100x uh, in terms of people inviting others and the user base will grow. So that's our, uh, that's our expectation for the coming year. So from that, you had you know amazing success and 7 million downloads. Everything's looking great. But as everybody listening will know, and especially working in tech, is that you don't learn anything from failures, missteps, or successes. And then earlier this year, Cubix's Calendar 2 had to pull the plug on the mining for cryptocurrency feature that enabled users to exchange for access of premium features from your product productivity apps because it simply just didn't work as you wanted it to. But what did you learn from that experience, especially on the back of so much success? So, yeah, last year, we one of our investors uh, approached us. He had invested in a company that mined Monero. Now, for those who don't know, Monero is a private cryptocurrency designed to be uh, mined on computers, regular computers, not uh, ASICs like the Bitcoin. So this is something that anybody could participate in on their own computer. And we were approached and, uh, you know, the idea occurred that we could actually, um, since calendars running on people's Mac uh, computers 24 seven, why don't we give them an option to um, essentially pay for the calendar instead of with money, just with um, CPU. In other words, uh, as long as you're mining the calendar uh, with some part of your CPU, the idea was about 5% of it, uh, then we would, uh, you know, it wouldn't be perceptible to you uh, very much. Uh, however, uh, you know, you'd get all the calendar features unlocked for free. We thought it was an interesting model. So we told exactly the users what will happen in the dialogue. Um, but then we learned a lot about interoperating with other companies and making sure that we uh, get the source code to open source products and so on. Uh, because in this case, uh, we had our team work with them, and for various reasons, you know, it turned out that this is a black box that <clears throat> when we tried to turn it off, for example, it wouldn't uh, turn off the mining. And also, <clears throat> the rate at which it was mining uh, wasn't 5%, and uh, sometimes it would even peg the CPU, and many people complained. So... Once these things started rolling in, I started getting um, uh, contacted by journalists. And you could see around that period, if you put in uh, Cubix calendar mining, uh, you'd probably see just articles from The Verge and from everywhere, you know, uh, including the BBC and Newsweek uh, had uh, eventually covered it. But the story was originally broken by a guy from Mars Technica. And basically, uh, <clears throat> I realized at that time two things. One is that we're going to have to take this out. Uh, because proof of work mining just isn't uh, a good set of incentives. Uh, you know, you're using your CPU, and there's always this incentive to take someone's CPU, whether it's uh, you know on a website or something like that, without telling them, uh, as we actually at least told them. And the other thing is that um, when dealing with uh, the media, you know, there's a certain uh, um, it's incumbent upon you to at least tell your story and and and. Uh, give the numbers about your company. So we did that and we, we feel that it's mostly positive for Cubix because at least we were able to tell the world how many users we've got on calendar and so on, um, but <clears throat> it gave us some notoriety. But at the end of the day, we don't want anymore to ever have to do with proof of work mining. Um, and so when we're building our cryptocurrency, we designed something that is far more scalable and far less intensive uh, of, of um, of a, an energy use. So if we, for example, want to have a token that's, you know, uh, make sure it's not double spent, you don't need the whole network to go ahead and look at that token. You don't need to send every transaction to every potential miner in the world. That's overkill. There's mathematical results that show that if you're just watched by about 20 computers out of the whole network, then that token, there's an infinitesimal probability of it being double spent. Uh, as long as they run a consensus. So there's systems out there right now, like MadeSafe out of Scotland, that do this kind of thing, and Holochain, which have only a subset of the network using it, and only 0.01% of the CPU is needed and the memory. So that's the kind of solutions we're, uh, you know, we're bullish about, and uh, you might see more of that uh, coming in the next uh, few years from Cubix. Fantastic. And after successfully... Uh, 
overcoming these challenges, you now launching the platform on which these apps were built. And my understanding is that Cubix combines functionalities of the top online community applications, such as familiar names like Facebook, Meetup, Slack, and so many more, but on a decentralized server that protects personal data from third parties and allows online communities the freedom they need to actually own their brands and grow their own networks. But can you help the listeners understand exactly what it is and the kind of problems that it's solving? Absolutely. So this is the heart of Cubix. Um, you know, our first phase consisted of just putting out some apps for people to use for their own personal use. And we've reached 7 million people around the world that way. But, uh, you know, the vision was never just to have apps for personal use. The vision was to have apps that unite communities. The thing is, if you've got today a, a blog, you can download uh, WordPress and own your own blog. And that means not just uh, in terms of owning your own data, but also being able to set up any kind of theme, any kind of plugin. And there are now thousands and millions of plugins that you can install for uh, WordPress. Imagine the amount of effort it would have taken to build your own blog from scratch, uh, invent all those plugins, test them, debug them, and make sure that uh, they're stable. Uh, well, <clears throat> the, the point is all that effort's been done by a community, and uh, the WordPress community is quite large. In fact, WordPress powers 30% of all websites in the world. Now, imagine having to do that to have your own social network. Today, there is no good software to run social networks. So even when you have something like a cruise ship, which is disconnected from the internet largely, has bad internet, or maybe a, a plane on which you're staying for 10 hours, or perhaps uh, it's a village somewhere in the world that doesn't have a good internet pipe you know, to the worldwide internet. Why don't they simply use their own software for things like dating, making doctor's appointments, making plans to go out, maybe you know, study groups in a university, maybe they'd like to collaborate on a document. If they're all in the same place, why are they using Google Docs? Why do they need to use Facebook? Because there is no good open source alternative. Now, there may be in the future, and there are some projects, but we believe that Cubix has a massive head start since 2011. We've reinvested almost all the money that we've, uh, put, that we've earned from these apps. We've reinvested into building a platform that anybody around the world can use. And when we're talking about, sometimes it's important on a societal level. So it's not just about having really, really fast collaboration within your university. It's also about the security of your nation state or your village. Uh, think, for example, about Facebook and how uh, there's increasing uh, complaints about its um, uh, effect on democracy, for example. Elizabeth Warren uh, famously is calling out uh, to break up uh, companies like Facebook because they're very centralized. If we don't want government uh, action, uh, we're going to have to build open source alternatives and then we can avoid uh, government breaking up uh, these companies. We want to own our own data, but we also want to own our own relationships. So that's very important. And we've spent all this time building. And, and, and one of the interesting things we had to do is manage the society versus the individual, the collective versus the individual kind of questions. And so if you look at Russia or China, uh, you're going to see laws passed. Just recently in Russia, they passed a law that if you criticize the government, you could go to jail. Um, there's a warning and then there's a period. But at the end of the day, this is a law now. And in China, of course, everybody knows that uh, you have to be careful about what you say. And freedom of speech is not as widespread as it is in the United States. Uh, so the idea, again, is that if you want people to be able to, on a local level, uh, communicate with one another without fear of being, you know, necessarily uh, uh, without everything going through a central server, uh, whether it's in the United States or in Russia or anywhere else, uh, you're going to benefit from having your own server. And I understand this is scary to some governments, but you know there was a time when we didn't have our own desktop printers. We didn't have our Xerox uh, copiers. You needed permission to even publish anything. Uh, there was a time when we didn't use uh, Skype. We had only telephone systems that operators would connect you uh, overseas. We had all these things, and now technology has empowered individuals to do things on their own with blogs, and with things they own, why not have the same thing uh, instead of giant centralized corporations building your software and renting it from them, like sharecroppers creating content, why not own your content? Why not police your own community? And then we can have actual conversations that governments like, which is 
hey, how do you keep, let's say, child uh, pornography off of your uh, network? How do you keep uh, human trafficking posts off of your network? Well, if it's a small network and you can actually manage it, then these things would actually be feasible. So these are just some of the reasons why people and societies might benefit from having a software that lets them run their own networks out of their own uh, computers. Whenever I read about exciting projects like this, especially when you've got such a big head start as well, I always feel compelled to look for real world use cases and how that technology is going to be used. And on this occasion, I quickly learned that the platform is currently the framework for the presidential candidate Andrew Yang's official app. I mean, can you tell me more about this and the story behind it and how he got involved? Well, sure. But I just want to correct one thing right there. It's not the sure. official app. Okay. Uh, sure. We actually built it as a grassroots, grassroots uh, effort. Uh, the Yang gangs are very passionate, uh, but it's also a decentralized community. So uh, we never took money from the campaign. Uh, we spent our own money on this, and we worked together with the Yang gangs to create the app. So we should rather say it's by supporters for supporters. Yeah. Uh, and this is imp- this is actually maybe in some ways unprecedented. Uh, because the Bernie app, for example, the Bernie campaign had put up an, put out an app called uh, the Burn app uh, earlier this year. And we were proud that we had started about a year earlier and we've turned out something much, much more social. You can take a look. Uh, the app is at yang2020.app. So it's not .com, it's .app. Um, it's designed to connect all the Yang gangs uh, and their supporters together, help them organize. So when it comes time to hold a rally, for example, we take care of rides. So you don't have a car, it's a rural area, no problem. We'll match you up with people going to and from the event. Uh, We can see who's going to the event. You don't have to exchange business cards. You could simply friend people right on the app who, who went to the event. You could see their interests and who they are. You can even search instantly for who is a developer or who is this and that to do essentially carry out different projects within the community. And that's the thing. We empower the community not in a centralized manner where Andrew Yang's campaign has to go ahead and do everything, call everybody, put together every event. But rather, we allow things to happen from the bottom up. And when the campaign rally gets large enough, they could get Andrew Yang to actually come there. And uh, that's that's the promise, right, is, is actually getting those states and those cities that may not otherwise be even on the radar uh, to organize themselves. And if they get big enough, they can actually get either Andrew Yang or now he has these things with a hologram that you could actually put. Uh, there's this new technology that you can appear in several places at once, like with the Tupac uh, at, at Coachella. So they're exploring that. But again, the idea is having a decentralized network not having only one uh, one group from the top having to organize and having all that responsibility to ban or to organize or to uh, essentially think of all the possible places and people and things that they should want to do. And I, I want to make one other point. I think it was 2007 or 8 when uh, Obama, the Obama campaign was approached about using social media. And because they did that, I believe, That put them over the top, both in the primary as well as in the general election. Having social media at the time was a game changing. um, It was a game changer, essentially, to beat your opponent. Today, everybody has that. And I think having your own campaign app rather than relying on Facebook or uh, Telegram or anything else. The reason is when you have your own app, you, you can have insights, first of all, into how people are using it. And secondly, you can control the kind of features you put in there. So we have a feature where people can watch a video live and uh, comment on it together with other Yang supporters. Of course, Facebook has this. It's called watch parties. But again, what if Facebook didn't have a feature like the feature that we have with the group rides? Facebook doesn't have that. So again, the idea is to own your own data. And sometimes you also need to be compliant. Another reason why we're not a part of the official campaign is because there are also rules about how you store the data and everything like that. So we have to be very careful about um, the database. And when you have a giant database of everybody in every network, it could get hacked. That's another thing is that besides the NSA, there are hackers out there that actually get into these databases. And what was it the other day? I heard 2 billion email addresses have been, uh, and passwords and just information about people have been leaked. Uh, And this database has really just been uh, 
uh, given away almost um, on the dark web. And we're talking about it's it's, it's basically a compendium of all these other leaks, you know, from Equifax, hundred million people, or Yahoo, which is all close to a billion. Um, when you have all these things in, in a central database, you're going to have to use that information on the server side. And wherever you're going to store those keys, you're going to eventually uh, have to use those keys on the server side. So once the hacker gets those keys and decrypts the database, it's game over. Um, by contrast, if it's your networks, first of all, running all over the place, and these networks are in many different places, not even the NSA um, is going to find it easy to get a backdoor into every one of those networks. So the data is not all in one place. And of course, if you have end-to-end -end encryption, as they're now adding to WhatsApp and Telegram and everything else, they've already added end-to-end -end encryption. Although with WhatsApp, Facebook, you just have to trust it. And uh, Facebook says it might actually put back doors into that. Uh, but the idea is, what if you have your own open source software with end-to-end -end encryption? You can actually trust it a lot more because it's you running that software. It's you making sure that the software has been signed and vetted by security analysts and then it's running on your servers. So at least that's one less vector you have to worry about is um, because the, the information is encrypted when it's not on your phone. So um, for all those reasons, it's very interesting. But with Andrew Yang, um, I met him last year. The story is that uh, I was always a big fan of UBI ever since a few years ago when uh, I read about the idea of just giving people money. And this is shocking, trusting them with how they're going to spend the money. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's uh, the Republicans talk about vouchers uh, to replace failing schools and allow consumers choice. And Democrats are talking about a single payer system for uh, health for health care. It's interesting that Democrats may not necessarily trust the uh, the school system with the same kind of single payer system uh, voucher that they trust uh, when you can choose your own doctor. Um, but if you go one step further and just give people money. You don't need vouchers that are earmarked to a certain thing. You just give them money and they decide how to spend it. There have been studies that if you give homeless people homes in Utah, turns out you spend less and people actually get a home than you would spend on all the services like, uh, you know, um, taking care of them or incarcerating them or, or the running the prisons. So the thing is that perhaps just trusting people with their own choices is a winning idea. So when uh, I was talking about UBI for the longest time and I wanted to build it into the community apps to have a con community currency that is used every day within the community, but then inflated uh, gradually, just um, sort of, I should say, more of it appears autonomously and uh, maybe 1% per year and or per month or whatever it is. And then it's given to the people. So is there going to be inflation? Yes. But because it's electronic and we can actually just hold the numbers in uh, in, a, in an electronic database, uh, a lot of the inflation is, is managed uh, just numerically. Uh, and, and then you just really talk about uh, re the money stays in the community. So it's really just a redistribution, a constant gentle redistribution of wealth to everybody, a sort of reset that is going on continuously. And so that creates more equality of opportunity that can be done to eliminate food insecurity in the community. And we wanted to do this on a local level Again, totally voluntary. No one has to accept this currency. But if they do, they understand that it's gently losing its uh, value over time. Uh, just like Visa, you pay 3%. You understand that, but you still pay it to do the credit card processing. So we wanted this voluntary thing. We got all these, even anarcho-capitalists uh, are on board with it because it's completely voluntary. And of course, anarcho-socialists and uh, other people that want to see food insecurity eliminated were very happy about this and social Democrats. So we got everybody uh, across the board of political spectrum really interested in that kind of stuff. The Republicans like the family values aspect that you can take care of your kids more. Uh, the Democrats uh, and liberals would, would like the fact that people don't lose their dignity. You know, they can uh, have uh, without, you know, the means tested welfare, you kind of have to say you're disabled perhaps or something like that to be on the dole, you know. and. So this could be a more moral society. And so my friends told me that, hey, there's this guy running for president. And this was 2018. Uh, Andrew Yang is running for president, and uh, you should talk to him. So it took me about a month, but finally, I think it was his cousin or something that uh, finally introduced me to him. 
and I, it was it was random. And uh, I met him in May 2018. He said, "Hey, um, I'd like to uh, how you know? Yeah, I, I I want UBI and you want UBI. How can we help each other?" And it was a very friendly guy. Um, although I should say that every presidential candidate has this this thing about them where they have to repeat the same phrases over and over in their campaign. So you know, it, it's a job I don't envy. Um, <laughs> You know, but it definitely gives you a certain uh, gives you a certain thing about um, having you have to have that personality and uh, it, it definitely shapes the way you speak and talk. So but still. So, you know, despite that, Andrew's very friendly and he says, OK, so how can we help each other? I said, look, there's two ways we can help. One is that uh, we want to build an app for you. We want to build an app, uh, but it won't be part of your campaign. It'll be sort of a separate thing. We'll call it the UBI app at the time. We wanted to just call it not even name it after his campaign. Um, later, we had renamed it to yang2020.app. And the idea was to, uh, again, to, to, to create this parallel grassroots support for UBI and then to support his campaign because we believe that even if he doesn't win, uh, you know, we can have this app, we can have this grassroots support and we can actually build something for UBI the same way that WordPress has a community for WordPress developers or the same way any, any movement has support and conferences and speakers and books, we need to unify the UBI community if we're going to have any sort of um, effect on, uh, on world politics and at least be part of the conversation in a more powerful way. So having Andrew run is, is uh, obviously a great boost to the UBI community, which includes, by the way, venture capitalists like Andrew Wenger, who wrote a book called World After Capital, here at Union Square Ventures here in New York, very famous uh, venture capitalist uh, firm that invested in Twitter and uh, lots of other uh, companies that you know. So even VCs support this because they see the automation starting to lower demand for human jobs. I don't say replace human workers because then people get this idea that a robot has to do everything a human does. But in fact, no, just by making the human faster or more efficient, you can cut the workforce right there. So the idea isn't that automation has to jump to you know, artificial general intelligence to s replace workers. No, they can actually just be computers and, and uh, allow people to be more productive. And we've seen this. We've seen this, but people don't recognize this. But there's a book called by Piketty called, you know, uh, uh, I forgot, Capital, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, where it talks about essentially automation. And, and you don't have to go to this book. The, the data is quite available. Um, automation's increased. Uh, tremendously, uh, the productivity of the American worker, and yet wages have only increased about 12%, I think, in uh, real uh, wa wages have increased about 12% in the last 40 years. Meanwhile, CEO pay uh, has increased 900% in the last 40 <laughs> years. So we can definitely see where the money's going from <laughs> all those productivity gains. Anyway, the bottom line is um, we, we have our interests aligned, and I told Andrew that we will build and after him, he was very happy. He put me in touch with Scott Santons, who you might want to interview. Uh, he is one of the biggest uh, proponents of UBI, uh, the other being Rutger Bregman, I believe, uh, in Europe. And so he put me in touch with him. We made the app. We launched the app. Uh, we got uh, thousands at, at this point of supporters onto the app. And every day, people are finding it and downloading it and connecting and supporting the Yang campaign. If uh, the Yang campaign doesn't succeed to uh, get Andrew elected, we're going to turn that app into a UBI app connecting every chapter of um, the UBI community together. Now they're called Yang Gangs. Maybe in the future there'll be UBI conferences and supporters. Finally, uh, I told Andrew what he could do for us, which is to, you know, he's speaking to all these mayors around the country for UBI, including uh, Michael Tubbs in Stockton, California. Very famously, uh, he was one of the first cities that wants to implement a UBI pilot and see what happens when you give people money. Well, we have a better idea. Instead of having just a pilot with five people or 20 people, how about having a cryptocurrency which gently inflates and uh, get support of that? So cities like um, uh, the Berkshires, Connecticut, have Berkshires. And in, in England, we've got Bristol, Brighton, and uh, pretty much any other city that starts with a BR seems to uh, have a... Uh, uh, <laughs> Bradford, you need you need to secure Bradford then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that may be the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but 
So there you go. So that's what we build. I'm sorry uh, for going on so long, but this this was a natural fit for us because if we're building apps for communities, the next step is building currencies for communities. And that's when we can make a difference on the fiscal level and see if we can actually help end things like food insecurity and help people with uh, even health insurance possibly using this uh, system. Such a great story. And I love how your actual meeting with Andrew was such a, a random encounter because sometimes it really does feel that the universe just kind of gives us that nudge in the right direction, doesn't it? You know, it's funny. He even said that. He said the universe has brought us together. <laughs> <laughs> really? A man, spooky. <laughs> and of course, the, the beauty of Cubix to me is that it's aimed at everyone and almost anyone can use it. But I've got to ask, I mean, outside of that political spectrum, I mean, who's it aimed at and who are your target audience? So our target audience, first of all, is very wide and varied uh, in the end of the day, once we've built out the whole thing, because we're talking about a general purpose social operating system. Think about how uh, the Mac OS was an operating system that was graphical. So at the time, everything was text-based, and you used uh, DOS to type in commands, and computer uh, use was kind of arcane. Uh, and then what happened with the graphical user interface is suddenly you could have Mac Paint, you could uh, point uh, and, and draw, you could have what you see is what you get, uh, word processors where you literally could see the document in front of you. Um, these were revolutionary things, but if you think about what it meant to develop an application before that, you had to build all of it yourself. The windows, the menus, the cursor uh, position, the fonts, and everything else like that, the buttons, right? Now, the operating system provided all of that for you. So the question is, who is the Mac OS for? And the answer, and, and who is Windows for a yeah. few years later? And the answer, of course, is that um, anybody could build an application using these things for any other audience. So there is this whole ecosystem of application developers, middlemen, you can call them, um, that they could actually build uh, something on top of the operating system. So the way we think of Cubix is the same way. We're just building the first initial applications on top of it, which happen to be things like connecting a community together. So Andrew Yang was a perfect uh, case study and use case for what we're doing. It's a federated community with sub-communities like uh, the Yang gangs, but there's also a, a need for each person to have their private information private to enforce rules of access control and have real-time communication, notifications. Uh, so the kind of things that we have in our quote-unquote operating system for the web, for the social web, is that we actually build, um, you know, the login process, for example, authentication, uh, ha have you forgotten your password? We have a system for that. Uh, Real-time chat, real-time video conferencing. We can even have video conferencing now with the web. You don't need zoom.com anymore. Um, we have uh, group rides, group events. Uh, we have essentially, you can do all the things you can do on social media, tag people, invite people. You can invite them 20 different ways. We can track the invite. We can reward people based on who they invite. And they can have a credit system, which they spend credits inside the app. What they spend it on and what the applications are, are up to the application developer. So the apps that we currently have, and I can speak about who our audience is currently, <clears throat> it is the community leaders. So we're talking about everyone that has a Facebook group or a Facebook page that they are uh, managing. They might want to let their own members create events and drive each other to these events and post photos in such a way that they have more control over their community. They might want to have control over their own brand. So we're talking about brand, uh, brands and influencers might want to have their own community. Like Nike might want to have a Nike app. Or if they have a Nike app, they might want to put widgets in there that help their members connect right off the bat and out of the box. So that's the kind of stuff that we can do. And frankly, we're even considering uh, uh, disrupting a bit the space of investing into startups. Because a lot of the time, startups need a CTO to build those same tired things over and over. User sign up, uh, you know, the web app, the native app notifications, real-time communication. If all that stuff's already built, why not just use it? So we're thinking about creating a CTO as a service kind of platform where investors can come and find startups, which they fund to build an MVP. And we help build that MVP and we use the money that investors put uh, in, a, in essence to, 
to pay for that initial outlay. But once they have the MVP, they can go on and they can uh, raise any kind of money, but they will have been using the Cubix platform. So the idea is, once again, to build this distributed network of Cubix certified developers, just like WordPress developers around the world, where we might not get the initial money, but we, we, will, uh, we will have an ecosystem with Cubux tokens, which developers are paid in, and essentially have an ecosystem of web development that doesn't look anything like the centralized uh, sites of today, but actually uh, looks like a bunch of developers around the world who receive certifications, who join marketplaces, sell their widgets, and then get paid using micropayments as different companies use their widgets for all kinds of things, whether they're a startup or whether they're an end user community that wants to use them uh, for any kind of uh, purpose. And you'll say it seems almost every day at the moment we're hearing about stories around the importance of local networks, decentralization and data privacy. And the recent Instagram breach is a great example. But how important do you feel de decentralization and data privacy is at the moment? I think it's really important to individuals. And I've, I've touched on this in uh, just earlier in this uh, interview. The thing is that, you know, if you're an individual, your privacy could be very important to you. If you're a government, of course, you, you'd love if no one had any privacy uh, because then you'd be able to investigate every crime by just looking at what people have said. Uh, in fact, you might want to have drones looking in in people's houses. There's now research that you can look at vibrations on a, a paper bag or a plastic bag of uh, potato chips and kind of figure out what people are saying in the room. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I've not seen that. That's insane. That is insane. Imagine that drone hovering outside your window a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, there's lip reading, like in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, and yeah. uh, and then uh, the government will say, I'm sorry, Dave, I cannot do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, of course, governments uh, would always want less privacy and uh, people would want more. So there's always this tug of war. And I can understand this because when you're building something like Telegram or what we're building, which is more open source, uh, including the server side, when you're building that, you're constantly aware of how much power you have as the initial architect of the system and how much responsibility you have to make sure that um, whatever it evolves to balances the interests of both the individual and society. So the truth is that we're going to have end-to-end -end encryption. This is not a question of morality or whether something is more right or more moral. It is simply a question of availability of technology. It is so cheap to put end-to-end -end encryption in terms of simple implementation that it's already been done. It's done in WhatsApp and it's done in Telegram at least. And it's done in more private things like Signal, um, which, which is built by Whisper Systems and a couple guys that left, uh, that built WhatsApp and then left Facebook because they were very upset about how Facebook's uh, handling their baby. Uh, WhatsApp was supposed to be paid for by actual money, uh, but instead, uh, it's, you know, Facebook needs to uh, make sure that um, you know they they get some relevance for advertising uh, if they ever want to have brands pay a third party pay for your use of WhatsApp. And they say if you're not um, paying for it, then you're the product, right? So your conversations would probably be monetized in one way or another. And of course, now Facebook uh, is under more regulatory scrutiny, all these companies are, about what are you doing um, you know, to, uh, to police the posts on your network. And of course, that means that end-to-end uh, -end encryption uh, maybe won't be necessarily uh, very useful to them. So you know, first of all, for years, Facebook has internally been pushing to remove or circumvent the end-to-end -end encryption that's in WhatsApp. Then recently, this year, Mark Zuckerberg uh, wrote that he promises that they're going to double down on end-to-end -end encryption and that privacy is really important to him and that Facebook will do better and, in fact, give you the most private network ever, etc. And, of course, then a few months later, it turns out Facebook is has been talking about putting back doors into WhatsApp uh, in order to, you know, help cover its own butt uh, with, uh, with uh, governments. So when you're a giant corporation, you're essentially um, on the hook for whatever you do. In one uh, instance, you are 
chastised by the German government for taking down a, for for not taking down a post. And in the, another instance, you're chastised by the U.S. government for taking down a post. I mean, just the other day we have. Donald, Donald Trump, there's a leaked memo. Speaking of privacy, I mean, it was leaked. But the point is, uh, you know, um, the memo says, uh, it's not a memo, it, it's, it's a draft of a, of, of a plan to censor the internet. Okay, and people think this is unprecedented, but just last year we had SESTA, FOSTA passed in the Congress about child trafficking uh, and child pornography, where they literally, uh, you know, they, they, they basically um, said that these networks have to police those kinds of posts, an entirely reasonable position, except that these networks are too big. They can't police the posts, so they just turn off the entire section. They just disallow certain kinds of speech. So there's unintended consequences when you get government to do it. But if you uh, have local networks, small networks, that allow people to do things on the local level, well, guess what? They can actually uh, get things done. And we're not just talking about end-to-end encryption. We're talking about infrastructure. They have now... The New York City mesh network is becoming rather big. Uh, there's a GUIFI in Spain. There's Freifunk uh, in Germany. Okay, we're talking about I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, Freifunk or Freifunk, uh, but uh, the idea is again that we have these networks by the people for the people that don't use ISPs. Okay, there's this thing uh, that uh, President Trump and his administration pushed for, and the Republicans in Congress pushed for allowing ISPs to sell your data without your permission. Um, this was re- recently banned, and then they rolled back these regulations. So now ISPs can sell your data. Well, guess what? They can also throttle your data after net neutrality was repealed. Why rely on centralized ISPs? In the United States, they refuse to compete with one another. They're basically a cartel. Um, so we're talking about landlines here. So uh, again, why not have mesh networks where Wi-Fi joins into overlapping uh, networks, and you route messages through an entirely local infrastructure. Well, there's no good software for any of that. If there was, you could have an African village somewhere in Namibia, for example, or the favelas in Brazil could actually make plans and have a dating site and have a ZocDoc uh, appointment system and have a restaurant reservation system without having to use open table. I mean, these are basic things. Why do we have these giant sites that that extract rents Because the entire uh, system, the capitalist system that we have, is essentially uh, about taking all the risk up front. And it's even more than that. The public is shut out of investing into these things because of 1933 securities laws. The government protects people from uh, making mistakes if they don't have enough money to to gamble on these uh, startups. So what happens is that the VCs essentially have the first pick of – and the angel investors have the first pick of which startup they're going to, uh, to to fund. And these unicorns, you know, all the capital appreciation happens before they go public. Uh, the vast majority, I mean, of the the flight up to the star, uh, up to the sun. And a lot of the times these companies like Uber, for example, we found out is losing money. Even WeWork perhaps uh, has, uh, you know, interesting. But then we're talking about MoviePass. Okay, which is uh, essentially been invested in by Helios and Matheson, um, was built entirely on losing money. Uh, I remember when we were in uh, TechCrunch Hackathon, and um, uh, there was uh, Twilio at the time. It was a company that allows uh, people to send SMS text messages, said, build on our API. And so the first thing everybody thought of and we thought of was group chat. But we rejected it right away because we said one message results in 10 messages being sent. So that's a big money loser. We can never make that up by anything, including advertising in text. Uh, But guess what? One group over there had uh, actually did it, done it, and it was GroupMe. So GroupMe was sold to Skype and GroupMe lost massive amounts of money. But then it was (laughs) essentially subsidized with uh, private investment. And then Skype eventually was sold to Microsoft, of course, for $60 million. So at the end of the day, we're talking about money losing enterprises being subsidized by private uh, investors knowing that they can dump them on the public before you know on the IPO before everybody kind of realizes or the market realizes that they're not worth as much uh, in their current state um, now there are some successful enterprises like Amazon they don't lose money they reinvest all their profits and that's what we do we reinvest all our profits so we don't necessarily make profit that's not the same thing as having a money losing, uh, you know, system uh, and business model. But what, I guess what my point is, because 
capital under capitalism, the outlay is always up front by people who take risks. And of course, I should say, many of these investors lose their shirts, right? Many of the nine uh, lose their investments and uh, 95%, what is it, of startups fail or whatever you define as failure. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely, they're doing a valuable service as well. I'm just simply saying that uh, they, everyone else is shut out of, of, of being able to do that. But my point is they will want to recoup all of those uh, investments and more by having as much control over your ecosystem as possible, by having a monopoly, if Peter Thiel would have his way. He wrote a book called Zero to One, and he always said monopoly uh, competitions for losers. He would make many capitalists blush, you know, and the company that he helped fund, Facebook, even their own shareholders are very upset that they cannot remove Mark Zuckerberg uh, as CEO because he has all the majority of the voting uh, class of shares. So the point is that we have these systems that are completely owned. Uh, with, you know, they're not going to give away their server side software. They're not going to let everybody, an open source uh, competitor, you know, just copy them. That's what happened with America Online. America Online used to be a big uh, centralized site, and now uh, the web completely destroyed it as a social network. No one uses America Online the way they did it when it came out because the web is permissionless. The web is open source. Anybody can start a web, web server, and anybody can run a web browser. They know, there's no need for a middleman. Uh, and so the future, I believe, is open. Uh, anybody can run their own server. Uh, people will be able to use it for all kinds of things. They will be independent of the government. I'll, I'll say one other thing. Right now, as we're talking, just this week in Kashmir, the government uh, of India shut off their internet. And you can follow that story. I mean, uh, pharmacies are unable to fill the prescriptions. Stores maybe are unable to restock their shelves because so, on, so many people are reliant on an internet where the signal has to go to the global internet in order to get anything done. So smaller networks are more resilient. And I expect to see not just infrastructure from telecommunications, but in fact, even um, solar panels are, you know, are uh, decentralized. We're talking about energy generation could become decentralized. Cell phone signals can become decentralized. In Hong Kong, they had fire chat where it was just peer to peer uh, messages. Uh, and that fueled uh, people, uh, people's ability to talk uh, without being censored. Uh, in, a, in a stadium or when there's a blackout, uh, how are you going to talk? Uh, how are you going to talk when there's an emergency, when everyone's calling everybody, there's a busy signal? So actually, these networks are more resilient. The local networks are. The mesh networks connect on demand how they need. And there are no people extracting rents in order to recoup that initial investment. Rather, there is an open uh, system just like Wikipedia or science or open source software where everyone is free to contribute just a little bit. And why would they do this? Because they have some disposable time, some free time, because they have a UBI. <laughs> so that's my, the future I'd like to see is a bunch of people contributing to science, Wikipedia, open source software, people who are connected with local infrastructure that they themselves maintain like solar panels and uh, mesh networks. People essentially on a local level issuing UBI in their communities in order to not face food insecurity or not face giant hospital bills because everyone's got insurance. That's a community I'd like to see of free thinkers, of people taking care of their kids, people taking care of their parents, people uh, contributing to scientific uh, discovery, learning new subjects and being more educated. And frankly, just a more moral society where people don't have to pretend like they're disabled or maintain that even after they've healed just so they can get a handout from a large federal government. And I think that's the kind of world that we all want to live in. So if anyone listening wants to find out more information about the kind of work you're doing and following your progress, can you just remind them of where they can find out more information and equally the best way of uh, contacting a member of your team if they'd like to ask a question? Absolutely. You can always go to cubix.com. Now it's spelled Q-B-I-X.com. There's no U. And I often, I often say that we know we've made it when people can actually find our website and spell it correctly. <laughs> uh, so basically, it's cubics.com. And if you'd like to contact uh, myself as well, uh, you can just contact, uh, uh, well, probably the easiest one is just greg at cubics.com. 
Fantastic. Oh, you've been on an incredible journey and achieved so much. And it's incredibly exciting to see what you're creating here and for all the right reasons. But more than anything, just a big thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to come and talk with us today. So thanks, Greg. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Man, Greg's passion and enthusiasm for everything that he does and what he's building, what he's creating really shines through, doesn't it? I'm so grateful for him taking the time and coming on today and being so open and transparent because it's so important that we learn from our mistakes, failures, missteps, as as well as success. So for those reasons alone, I'm going to be following the story of Cubics very closely and hope to stay in touch with Greg too. Because, man, I need more shining lights like that around me in this world. And it's great to see how he's making a difference with what he's creating. But over to you. We've covered a lot of hot topics today. So I want to know where you stand on local networks, decentralization, data privacy, and, of course, the cubic solution. And I'd also love to hear if we've got any Yang gangers out there that are using that app that we were discussing And also anyone that's working in politics and wants to talk about how the increasing role of technology and what it's playing in politics too. Or even if you've just got a question that you'd like to ask yours truly. You can do all of that and more by simply emailing me, techblogwriter at outlook.com. Pop by my website, techblogwriter.co.uk. You'll find all the social channels, all the interviews and loads of ways of communicating with yours truly. All I ask, of course, is if you do follow me on anything, say hello. I always respond to everybody that engages with me. So come on in. The water is fine. Thanks for joining me as always. We've got a great week next week with so many guests booked in. I'm actually quite excited about this. So I'll see you all then. So a big thank you for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thanks for listening to the Tech Blog Writer Podcast. Until next time, remember, technology is best when it brings people together.